Welcome back, Reimaginers, and thank you very much for all of your support. Tobin and I are extremely grateful. On today's episode, we are going to be talking about two things. Um, the recent Netflix documentary on the U.S. Women's National Team called Under Pressure and FIFA's recent report, both have which given the women's soccer community a lot to talk about. So we are excited to dive in. Yeah, let's do it. And you seem like all geared up and ready to go wearing a full Reimagers United kit. Yeah, I felt like Sporty Spice today. You did? Yeah. I was wondering what prompted that. It's going to be a great episode then. Well, I, you also got dressed second and then put on a Reimaginers United hoodie, which well, is hot pink. So I felt like you kind of tried to outdo my dress. Well, I, I definitely wanted to um, be part of the team. So, <laughs> Plus, I always wear re. You always wear re. Yeah, let's dive into it. So... Um, for those that haven't watched the documentary, including myself. Like <laughs> you. <laughs> so for um, you. <laughs> for me. Um, like, talk to me about, like, the documentary, like, at large. Like, what, what did you think about it? Um, okay, great. So uh, I think earlier this week, um, mid-December, Netflix released a documentary on the U.S. Women's National Team's journey to the World Cup this summer. So it followed the team, I think, roughly a couple months before um, while they were you know, in camp, uh, trying to make rosters, and then through the tournament, and then a little bit after. Um, and I think as someone who has been a part of this team for a really long time, it was actually quite hard to watch. Um, I think, one, because the World Cup was so painful <laughs> that we all, I don't know, did we all want to relive it? I'm not sure. Um, and also, I think just because, you know, it's something that we've built and put our life into and care so much about the culture. So yeah. to have it represented um, in this way sometimes feels a little uncomfortable, especially when you don't have your voice really there. Yeah, I think, you know, the one thing that stood out to me, like, obviously, I didn't watch the documentary. So I think it will be like kind of a good back and forth between the two of us. Every cycle, every world championship, I remember um, being approached um, to do a documentary on that specific world championship. And every single team that I had been on, um, for one reason or the other, um, voted against doing it. And I thought it was interesting that for the first time ever, that this was the team that like voted to do a documentary. To step back a second, mm -hmm. I think you should share why you did not watch the documentary. Um, honestly, I just didn't want to. I think <laughs> one, cause it's like, nobody really wants to like watch the World Cup happen again. I'm so protective of like the US Women's Nash team, which is so funny because like I'm just a player that played my like, you know, time period on the US Women's Nash team. Well, I think that's honest. Um, I don't think we're not, the, the documentary wasn't made for us, right? No, no, uh, we're, definitely not. And we're biased. And yeah. I, I watched it um, because, you know, there's two types of people, like the type of person that's driving on the freeway and like, can't look away from the, from <laughs> the, the car crash. crash. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> and then there was another person who was like just taking care of their own safety and yeah. driving by. And that was you. Maybe you'll change your mind and take a peek in the rear view mirror. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but I did want to talk about a couple of things. In the first episode, um, it was in, an interesting point that uh, they kind of dug into what it's like when you actually make a roster. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted you to share a little bit about what that's like. In the documentary, it was juxtaposed, you know, first timers mm. to, you know, the vets, our peers that were making their fourth and fifth uh, World Cup rosters. I don't mm -hmm. know if, I mean, I'll say that again because I don't know if anyone played in five. <laughs> um, but making their fourth World Cup roster. Yeah. Um, but yeah, share your journey. I mean, how many World Cup teams have you been on and what were those calls like? Yeah, I've been on three World Cup teams, like three of three, which was pretty awesome. Uh, three of three, three. Out meaning, of <laughs> I never walked into a room where I was like going for a World Cup. Like, I never heard the the no. Oh, you never got called to yeah. say you weren't. And I guess to be honest, I've never heard the no. But like throughout the career, my career on the Nash team, like there were various stages of the yes. You know, okay. there was that first 
world championship, yes. And then there was, you know, where you're like a little bit like still unsure of your place on the team, yes. And then there's that like confident, yes, you know, and then the resounding yes, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I experienced like kind of like the various stages of that. Um, and each one of them were super special. And I think the magic of the U.S. Women's National Team is the yes, like the first yes, yes feels just as important as as the kind of like the confident like last yes, you know? Yeah, I think the only thing I could um, compare it to is a penalty. Like, <laughs> you know, no matter how confident you are, your heart is mm -hmm. just going, right? And that like, and it's funny because there are there is a very small difference i think between how you feel if you have no idea if you're going to make it if you're a bubble player mm -hmm. or if you're certain you're going to make it there's yeah. no difference really in how i felt mm -hmm. like my heart raced i was so relieved when i made it mm -hmm. and then i was so emotional because like you're not working harder towards the goal if you're like a, a set an established player versus a bubble player mm -hmm. like everybody's working so hard towards the goal and I think it's an amazing celebration. And we talk about this a lot. As athletes, we're lucky. We get celebrated all the time. Yeah. Um, and that celebration is like always a lifetime of preparation mm -hmm. to get one phone call. Yeah. The only difference is the penalty. You actually have to do something. <laughs> um, and when you get the phone call, you just are waiting to hear your fate, which is wretched. Yeah. And like actually the kind of the process of the call, like the call in general has been – um, different like I remember sometimes it was like you actually went into a room with the coach like at the end of the camp where they looked you in the eye and they told you what oh, was yeah, gonna happen so I true. remember another time where the whole team came down to a meeting and the roster was just put up on a board I remember another time where like it was a, a phone call you know which well, like that's what I think me was a phone call well but this one was a FaceTime Oh, I wow, would that's not like a modernization of the call. No, no, no. If I got a FaceTime from my coach. I'd be like FaceTime audio. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't need to see my face. Like, this is a private moment and a phone call, like, analog is suffice. Yeah. Um, I think you could have gotten away with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, let's be real. This documentary wasn't made for us. Like, we know too much. We feel too much about this specific <laughs> yeah, yeah. subject. But on in regards to, like, the overall, like, if you talk about general audience of what Netflix is, what their sports documentaries are, like, what stories did you like? What stories do you think people, the general public, like, would like about this documentary? I don't think I can zoom out and have an unbiased. Oh, I know. You're asking me because I already told you. Yeah. I actually loved... Um, Alex's story uh, when she was like sharing um, what her life is like in San Diego being a mom. Um, and it's actually, I haven't played a lot with Alex as a mom, maybe one year when she got back. Um, and I definitely haven't seen her in like in her club environment. And I thought it was really cool to see um, what that looks like for her because obviously yeah. she wears six hats and she part of her job is you know preparing for the world cup being a good player and then now she's the captain leading the world cup but then there's just that whole other layer of work that she does yeah. it's just like the brand that she's built um and there was like some very cute scenes of her just like picking up her daughter at swim class and dealing with her daughter you know having a lot of feelings about <laughs> alex having to work when she wanted to cuddle so like i thought, <laughs> I thought that was cute um and i enjoyed that and i think that for me is um, important in these documentaries because it is a peak in under the hood yeah. and obviously like we know Alex and we follow Alex on social and all the things and like it was still uh, storytelling that I didn't hadn't seen before and that was nice to watch I love that yeah as a professional soccer player and host of the recap show I'm always traveling training you name it so it's critical that I stay hydrated and drink electrolytes I've been drinking Element for quite a bit since they were our sponsor of the recap show during the World Cup, and I absolutely love it. Um, there's so many flavors to choose from, and there's nothing better than feeling hydrated. Element is electrolyte drink mix, um, and you don't have to be the recap show host to enjoy it or a pro athlete. You can mix it in a cocktail. Um, it's great to cure a hangover, not like I've ever had one. Um, and if you're like me, you can just drink it while watching sports. 
Basically, whenever you need an electrolyte boost, Element is there to help you out. And there's no sugar, coloring, filler, or artificial ingredients. All you need is Element. And even you can drink it hot this holiday season. The new Element Chocolate Medley features chocolate mint, chocolate chai, and chocolate raspberry. Skiers, snowboarders, ice skaters, anyone that lives in just a cold state, this is for you. I'm excited to try all these new flavors and just try Element in a different way. It's already incorporated um, into my life, so this would be a great way to mix it up. So you can enjoy a pack on its own or you can add it to your favorite cozy recipe. I'm most excited about choosing chocolate chai. It seems very festive. Right now, Element is offering a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serve packets free with any Element order. So try out all those new amazing flavors. It's a great way um, to try things, but also you can give one to a friend if you're feeling generous this holiday season. Get yours today at drinkelement.com slash recap. And remember, the deal is only available through my link. So go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash recap. The best part is Element offers a no question asked refund. So if you don't like it, no stress, no worries. It's totally risk free. Also, you can just give it to a friend if you don't like it. And I'm sure they will. At the end of the day, you get your money back. So you have nothing to lose and only electrolytes to gain. Big thanks to Element. Now back to the recap show. So the recap show was in the documentary, which was really cool. Um, (laughs) Says the girl who didn't watch it. it, (laughs) But heard about it. Um, Talk me through, like, what was that like um, seeing it in the documentary? Well, I think always, like, this is my third I think this is the third documentary that's been done around a team I was like associated with LFG Angel City and now this and I think the way that I watched all of them was please 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 don't say something stupid uh, just listening for both of our voices being like please please don't take something out of context um so that's really how I felt. Yeah. And honestly, if I wanted to like really enjoy it, I would have to watch it again, which I did with Angel City because yeah. I watched that entire documentary and like on 1.5 speed to just make sure that I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> then I watched it again and enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that so funny that like you really don't get to see the documentary before it's produced? That's like the whole thing. Yeah. It's a little scary. But it was really cool having the recap show in the doc, right? Like, did you think, wow, this, that, we did that? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think it was like our voices, our perspectives, our narratives mattered so that when you zoom out and you're telling a Netflix documentary about that World Cup, like the recap show impacted that and was a part of that. I think that was really cool. I will say, you know, excuse a little sparingly. It was just a little, uh, you know, you haven't seen it, but it was just a quick little hit. Well, I'm pretending like it was the whole thing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, but they they used the clips where our voice, they used our voices and the clips from the show when they were discussing um, like Carly's commentary and her impact. And I thought that was actually really um, a really good time to use our voices because mm. it kind of celebrated or showed that we had um a very nuanced Mm. and um intentional way of discussing topics Mm -hmm. and so i think when a lot of people were like how could she say that that's so horrible Mm -hmm. like i think we approached it the same way that we did literally in the privacy of our home when we were talking about it like we approached it like you know let's let's approach this with openness and curiosity Mm -hmm. and understanding and compassion um and you know what we got to a place where we were like meh you do have a responsibility as a commentator. You got to be aware of like how your words impact things, um, but also with understanding and yeah. uh, compassion. So I think it was great that they chose those words uh, because it was a t- uh, it was an example of when like the other types of broadcast narrative that were out there mm. like couldn't meet the moment in that way. Mm. Yeah, and when I reflect actually on the World Cup edition like version of the recap show, that was one of my most proudest moments of the show was we got to be um, thought leaders in a time where 
Um, like I feel like we really cut through a really hateful and toxic dialogue that started to swirl and we were able to bring like strong perspective um, and compassion to it yeah. and um, really meet the moment in a genuine way and a thoughtful way. Yeah. And just to kind of put like the player's perspective of what having like a, a documentary about a team like means is you have to remember that there's so many stories and so many characters that were part of that team that weren't represented in this documentary. Mm -hmm. And those can be for various reasons. They can be because a player was like, no, I have to be completely focused. I cannot have this um, as part of my World Cup. So they opt out of it. And I think a lot of really good players did something like that. There could be players that um, like weren't thought of because their stories weren't as interesting to a Netflix documentary. So I think that like it's really important for like the public to to remember that these are like very specific stories and specific characters, but like it doesn't, it's not the totality of what the team is. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I've always felt that way, like as a player on the team, that like we need to open the aperture a lot lar larger to different stories and different ideas and different perspectives, but also different motivations um, in order to see the full picture of what Oh, that's is. such a great point. It's like, if this is the only documentary ever, then it feels like it has to tell the whole story. But it can't tell the whole story. But yeah. if there's just like a lot more great sports content coming out, then we'll have a better picture of the culture of women's sports and some of the incredible stories of these athletes. Exactly. Love that. Yeah. So we just talked about like how the recap show like really led the way in, in a time where it felt like the dialogue was so toxic um most recently we realized just how toxic that dialogue was during the world cup and that came out with a fifa study that was just released about the abusive behavior in um and during the world cup yeah. and it was <clears throat> staggering yeah so to give a little context um, one in five players in the World Cup received some sort of targeted discriminatory abuse. Um, and homophobic sexual and sexist abuse accounted for 50% wow. of the abusive messages. And the U.S. women's national team was the most targeted team. By a mile. Yeah, and I think that um, that in a lot of ways felt reflective of um, the political climate in our country, Gosh. which is disheartening. Um, and it begs the question, and I think one of the topics that I've seen everyone talking about is um, the role of the media in that. Mm. And the... Uh, accountability that a pundit, that a broadcaster um, who has very harsh criticism on the team should have for kind of sparking this sort mm. of hate speech. Mm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. One, I'd be curious also like how much of that um, came internally. You know, because when you think of sports, you can kind of, you always think that hate comes from like the outside. So it would be like, one country hating another country if they win or lose or whatever. But I really truly believe that so much of this kind of hate and abuse came from the inside. When you're speaking to millions of people and giving an opinion about something, critiquing something, like you better understand that your words matter and that hate and abuse don't belong in this world. But don't you have compassion having done, like, we're not broadcasters, right? But, like, having done this show, don't you have compassion for the way that words get twisted and blown out of proportion? Yes and no. I mean, I think I learned that it would be very scary to do something live with this climate. It would be very scary because your words can get turned in an instant. But we're talking about a whole World Cup. We're talking about, like, game after game after game. I'm going to push you a little further because... Like just doing this show, yeah. Um, that is, you know, visible to our members, yeah. but it's on podcast. Um, we edit so much out of what we say, and I think that we are incredibly intentional in choosing our words yeah. to try to make sure that every single message that comes from this show has a positive impact in the world. That doesn't mean those words are positive, but just understanding the effect of them to yeah. make sure that we're pushing the needle in the direction that we want it to go, yeah. which is towards diversity, equity, inclusion, yeah. um, and celebrating progress. Well, I mean, look how far the Women's World Cup has gone, that now all of a sudden it's a... 
a, polit- a platform for a massive political agenda, knowing what's on the horizon, knowing the amount of audience that comes with that moment and using it, no, not for sport, no, not for the advancement of progress and equity and all the beautiful things about our game, no, but for hate and abuse. Yeah, and I think that there's times, especially with the U.S. Women's National Team, like we are a team that symbolizes a lot in terms of um, societal issues and the world that we want to see and how we want to reimagine right and there have been moments when the team decided to kneel or not to kneel where those political moments come down onto the field and they can be talked about Mm. but in this case what were we talking about we were talking about how the team celebrated or took photos or like i don't know like what were we what political thing happened yeah. that prompted this dialogue yeah you know what i think it was i think it was 2019 megan rapino bawling out have the having the tournament of her life and pissing a lot of people off who don't watch women's soccer who mm-hmm. don't care so they had to hold their breath for four years until the 2023 world cup and they were all just praying that you know that it would be a blunder so mm-hmm. they, they could say gotcha back yeah and you know what's the most unpatriotic thing Cheering against your own country. I know what. <laughs> and and you know what's so crazy is like you talk about like what this team means to so many people like globally to think that you know the the rhetoric that surrounded you know this loss, you know it was a travesty to lose in the way that the U.S. Women's National Team lost as a football team, like as a soccer team, like they that was the worst performance ever of soccer Mm -hmm. and yet that gets completely lost Mm -hmm. and i mean of all the conversations that we've had i actually find this the most interesting i spent the days since this report came out actually asking everyone that i had the opportunity what is their stance on pundits accountability Mm. for cyber abuse Mm. and um you know uh, another incident in women's soccer currently happened yeah. with um, with LJ receiving an enormous amount of racist hate speech um, and yeah. Emma Hayes coming out and saying that commentators need to be careful with the language that they're using when they're describing players because mm. it's sort of like teeing up mm. the trolls. Um, and, um, you know, I heard varying perspectives Mm -hmm. on the accountability that a pundit can have. And I think a lot of it has to do with like, what did they actually say? Like, Mm. you know, it's not that they're always accountable for all the hate speech or that they're never, it's more like, what did they actually say? Mm -hmm. Um, and when it comes to racism in sport, just like the way that black players have been and continue to be, um, systematically talked about in a different way. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that has a massive influence on sort of the gall that the public then has to yeah. be able to criticize um, and sort of gives like fuel to the flame of like, you know, racist ideologies or, or hate speech coming out because they're hearing on mainstream television this type of language being spoken about a player. So then, you know, it feels closer to take that next step that just a little bit further further Mm -hmm. um and next thing you know we've crossed over to something that's completely racist and like has absolutely no place in any of our commentary yeah and like as a player who you've received tons of hate and abuse throughout your career like have i as a player oh that just upset me (laughs) sorry no, as no, a player sorry. that's only completely loved. <laughs> loved. Yeah, that's me. Okay, um, thank you. And and it, uh, the best player ever <laughs> to you. every single oh, person. Oh, I feel so much better than you. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, like as a player, like talk us through like the player's perspective. It's kind of crazy and it goes to the larger point of like, what are we doing on social media? Like, like actually, sometimes I walk down the street and I'm looking around and I'm like, are you the type of person that goes <laughs> home and cyber police? Like, I don't understand. Yeah. Like, who are they? Where do they come from? Yeah. And what is so wrong? What is so wrong? But yeah. that is also not their individual responsibility in- entirely because we've set up a system that doesn't care for all people. Yeah. Know. But back to your point. Um, how does it feel? How does it feel? Like, if somebody, like, just says a comment, like, you're stupid. I hate how you play soccer. Oh, I hate it. You're ugly. <laughs> your face is wrong. You 
are the worst soccer player ever. This person's so much better than you. Like every single day for your whole entire life. If you want to engage in social media, that's what you're going to see. Yeah, I think that uh, we could pretend that we were all brave and that we don't see it or that we're above it. I think that I'm relatively unexposed because... Um, I don't know. I'm a millennial. I don't even really know how to get into these apps anymore. Um, but yeah, I think like I go through these like patterns where like I'll notice something and um, something negative being said about me and then I'll like go into a rabbit hole and like I'll dive into it and I'll scroll and I'll read it. And you can find these accounts that like, you know, have your face with like mean words like liar cheater like abuser horrible human like plastered on your face like i actually saw an account that had that as the icon same like somebody took time to do that i know know. and it it is a rotting of from the inside out that's what it feels like rotting and like i don't ever want to be insensitive to it yeah i don't want to be immune to it like it's wrong and people shouldn't do it yeah and like i i think that this year we've seen so many examples of even the good guys being mm. bad and i'm tired mm. of it i think that sometimes even people who are trying to defend mm. what they think is truly right like you have to remember that the other person is also defending what they think is right mm. um and so I think that it spirals. Yeah. And I think that, you know, every single time I've ever seen a mean comment about me, I've also seen someone defend me. But yeah. that is also, you know, I and I do appreciate it. But it <laughs> is also the reason that the trolls are there because yeah. they need someone to talk to, right? And I have a question for you. Yeah. You speak a lot about sports in various forms. Mm-hmm. What is the line that you draw between criticism and constructive criticism Mm -hmm. and callous commentary Mm -hmm. like how do you draw that line yeah I I always want to like err on the um the side of speaking for things and not against things so there's ways that you can say like I there's ways to be constructive and there's way to be like destructive and I think the language that you use can push one way or the other and you can say that you like something without saying that you d- don't like the other thing. So I want to answer my own question on how to uh, draw a line between what's constructive and what's not when we're ta- we're here. We're both here talking. Um, and I think the rule that I use that I try to apply to both of us is the exact same thing that I would say at home. Because I actually think that complaining and saying mean things about people like actually just like rots you a little bit. So when we're at home and like, you know, in, in the privacy of like, you know, close friends, you like might start to slip and say something like raw, right? Yeah. And I always try to check myself in my own, the privacy of my own self. Because it's not about how like, it's not about whether or not I'm going to be judged for saying something wrong. Mm-hmm. For me, it's not from the outside. It's from the inside. Mm-hmm. It's like, what kind of person do I want to be? What type of messages yeah. do I want to send? So I follow some simple rules like um, ideas, criticize ideas rather than people. That's why even wow. when we're like, oh, focus that. on Fox. I'm like, yeah, big broadcast is a concept that I have a problem with, but I have a really hard time saying I have a problem with that person mm. because it's like, I don't know them. Mm. I don't know their story. I don't know what led them to be who, the way they are. Um, and I really don't want to judge somebody that I'm watching on television the same way that I don't want someone judging me when they're watching me on television. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, I think that just like understanding that every single word that you say every day is an energy exchange yeah and what kind of energy do you want to be yeah kaylee asks what are you most looking forward to in the upcoming year um anything specific you want to accomplish learn or travel somewhere well thanks for the question um 2023 was um the year of cp23 that 2024 will be the year of (laughs) cp23 It's fine. <laughs> um, I have so many things that I want to say, but I think I'll just go really random and say that I want to go to Alaska in 2024. Ooh, very cool. Why Alaska? Why Alaska? Well, since we are recently back from a safari, we were just reflecting on how amazing it is to be fully immersed in the natural world the wild the wild the elements like we're just so protected here in our like safe little cities. I want to go to Alaska and I want to just 
be awed and wowed by like glaciers and like catch our own fish and like bring it back in coolers even though we don't have enough space in the freezer for it um that just sounds amazing i love that i just you know i am i just get this idea of where i want to go i have no i know nothing about it but then we go there and it's always awesome yeah alaska here we come yeah um, and if you all are interested, I, we're also thinking about moonlighting as um, like travel travel vloggers. So if you all continue to watch the vlogs, then maybe we'll be able to get a fourth job here. What a life. The world. What okay. a life. Should we even ask you a community question? I just took the whole time up. Yeah, yeah. Ask me, um, ask me a quickie. A quickie, okay. <laughs> Costanza Billy asks, what is your biggest football pet peeve? Um, like playing, watching this, the beauty of this segment it is whatever you want it to be. What do you want it to be? Um, I was thinking players who wear their socks really low. That's my pet peeve. <laughs> <laughs> That's your pet peeve? Oh, I know. People who don't have tight ponytails and their ponytails just kind of like flopping. Oh, like the, like, oh, the floppy hair. No, your ponytail. I was describing their socks <laughs> and your ponytail. <laughs> Okay, Marin asks, are you on Santa's naughty or nice list? You know what? That's TBD uh, <laughs> because the presents are still coming. <laughs> if I was to look under our miniature tree right now, I'd say I'm on Santa's naughty list. <laughs> um, I think I've been... <laughs> I think I've been quite naughty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your questions. Um, we love hearing from you. Um, and keep those questions coming. If you would like to ask us a question, please go ahead and join our membership. Um, and then before each episode, Tobin and I go in there and ask you all to ask us questions. We select our favorites, and that makes up everybody's favorite segment, Community Questions. What else can everyone look forward to at Reink? Um, everyone can look forward to Re-Ink 2.0, um, in 2024. We oh, are re-upping. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so many cool things that we're going to be doing. Um, that's kind of the fun part is like, we know what they are, but you all don't. Uh, but it's a lot <laughs> to be excited about. Um, obviously holiday shopping is kind of done. I hope you all got your holiday, um, gifts in but there are still a few um holiday things you can get that don't require shipping which is membership which is the gift that keeps on giving i keep saying that um bring awesome people into our beautiful community of reimaginers and the other thing you can get is a gift card oh yeah some people are big into those i think that all of my favorite gifts especially from extended family our gift cards. Gift cards. So if you're thinking about last minute um, goodies. And um, if you are in my extended family, you can get me a ring gift card. <laughs> I will accept that. <laughs> um, yeah. And just um, we're looking forward to um, just being engaged in membership. Keep co-creating the space into what you dream it to be because that's what it will be. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye. The Recap Show is a re-ink original series produced in partnership with HeadGum Studios. If you believe in what we're building and love this show, the most important thing you can do is follow or subscribe. Hit the plus sign on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave us a review and share the show with a friend. We are so grateful. The Recap Show is executive produced by Tobin Heath, Kristen Press, Shane Romani, and Jamie Friedman. For HeadGum Studios, the recap show is brought to life by supervising producer Katie Moose, associate producer Ali Khan, video engineer and editor Rochelle Chen, motion graphics Eddie Ramos. Thank you.